وهلا منكمل برنامجنا مع الجلسه الثانيه حوار مع الصحافه الاستقصائي الاسترالي بالانترناشونال كونسورتيوم اوف انفستيجيتيف جورنالست او الاتحاد الدولي للمحققين الصحفيين ويل فيتسكيبن يلي قام بتحقيقات عن البانما بيبرز حوار بديره ياسر عكاوي سي او اوف اكزيكيوتيف ماجازين عن مبدا المحاسبه والشفافيه أكيد بهالوقت بدي أذكر إنه التويت سبيد بعده ماشي ما تنسوا الهاشتاج اف سي ام ام سي اف سوري 16 اف سي ام جود مورنينغ ليدز اند جنتلمان وات ا جريت بليجر تو هاف such beautiful crowd with us today. Uh, thank you, Mary, for organizing such a beautiful event and bringing really open mind and great minds together. Um, we have today, and we have the pleasure to have with us, Mr. Will Fritzgeben. Uh, he's a reporter for uh, the International Consortium of International Journalists. Um, he worked on some of the most exciting Uh, projects, investigative projects, uh, in, in modern investigative jo uh, journalism. Um, the latest one, Panama Papers, exposing the financial industry and corruption. Um, uh, in, uh, and he will be sharing with us his thoughts of how investigative journalists today um, Uh, conduct their work in a more globalized world where uh, the, the, the concept of rights has outgrew geographical boundaries, yet legal challenges remain of how to advocate for change in such a diverse environment. Before I start with my questions with William, um, I would like to invite him to make his presentation. Will, please. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, May, for the generous invitation. If I come here today to speak about the Panama Papers, I stand on the shoulders of 400 other journalists or so who have worked with me on Panama Papers. I am one of a dozen or so reporters who work full-time with the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. and. If you like, we are both shepherds and we are both reporters and shepherds of journalists, the ones who try to coordinate as best as we can and sometimes with some very strong individual personalities, hundreds of journalists to work simultaneously on the same project to have the kind of uh, connected global impact that Panama Papers had. I wanted to share a brief investigation with uh, presentation with you just to give you a visual sense of the Panama Papers, because especially in a conference like this one where we're talking about digital realities, online challenges and journalism, I think understanding what 11.5 million documents can look like is an important starting point. This is a uh, visualization of some of the networks that exist within the Panama Papers. Remember that Panama Papers are 11.5 million <coughs> files from one particular law firm. And this visualization here shows you the connections between banks, between accountancy firms, between individuals who may have set up offshore companies or offshore bank accounts. And what I like about this is it's the perfect visual demonstration, even if we don't understand it, I think, of how individual journalists really in 2016 have an interest in working together. 
more and more it's become a phrase in investigative journalism to say that if financial flows and if financial crime in particular doesn't have borders, then neither should journalists. And that's very much a motto that the Panama Papers team and other investigative journalists are increasingly taking on. This is another visual representation of what we're talking about when we talk Panama Papers. In red, we have the two or so terabytes that represent the size of the Panama Papers leak, and in black next to it, you have previous leak-based investigations that you might be familiar with, including the WikiLeaks trove of diplomatic cables, which is at the top, and then previous ICIJ investigations, including one that looked at HSBC Privates Bank in Switzerland and clients who were using that for various legitimate, but rather more worryingly, illegitimate uses also. Connected Minds is a perfect conference to talk about connected journalists. ICIJ is very much of a community mindset. I think, largely thanks to Hollywood, when we talk or think about journalists, many of us still think about the lone wolf who sits in the back of a newsroom, probably smokes too much, probably drinks too much, and is a bit of a grump. <laughs> they still do very important journalism. ICIJ's model, however, and I think we've proven that it can have success, is to say, how much more impactful can we be as journalists on global issues if we harness the knowledge and the skills and the local nous of reporters in their own countries? And to go back to what we were talking about just earlier about the cities panel, if local mayors know best what's good for their local regions and environments, our firm belief is that local journalists know best how to tell stories and what stories to tell. For example, we brought on an Algerian partner in Panama Papers and within half an hour he had found the name of the daughter of the current Prime Minister of Algeria, whereas 380 other journalists who had looked within the same files for over a year had not found that person. So local knowledge in journalism just as in cities is crucial and it gets me excited. There's some of these previous investigations because I think Panama Papers could not have been possible without two precursors. One is the digital revolution. Purely and simply speaking, Panama Papers required a certain level of technological ingenuity for us to even receive the information in the first place. But the other important factor of that is previous experience in managing journalistic investigations. I can tell you that it's not easy to convince a major newspaper who's used to breaking scoops of their own. It's not easy to convince them to coordinate and publish with 80 other news organizations. It's not easy to convince The Guardian or the BBC or the New York Times or Le Monde that holding back a story that they would usually print on the front page as soon as they found it is actually only a s is actually not the best idea and that they should wait weeks, months, sometimes even half a year before they publish that same story. But we're getting there, bit by bit. And I think to round off my introduction to Panama Papers, I can't speak about the project without speaking of these two Germans. These are the two reporters at Süddeutsche Zeitung. They share the same surname, but they're not related, mm. who quite astonishingly had the instinct when they received the data, the first files of the 11 and a half million that became Panama Papers, they had the instinct to say, oh my goodness, this is too much for one man or for one newsroom. So these are the two journalists who ICIJ have worked with in the past who turned to us and said, can you help us build a global coalition of journalists to tell these stories of the public interest, to tell stories not only about taxes that have been avoided or taxes that been, have been evaded, but also stories about how financial secrecy has been used to defraud nations, to potentially facilitate crimes that include war crimes and that include crimes against children, for example. And these two were at the beginning of that very generous decision that I think we'll see more of in the future as journalists. And then finally, technologically speaking, because I think it's exciting to put some bones on what Panama Papers was, 
we use two or three important technological tools when working with Panama Papers. This first one is a secure network, if you like, where journalists meet, exchange ideas, and work together. It's like a Facebook of journalists, but I believe the prototype was actually first used for an online dating service. So, <laughs> just goes to show, everything can be repurposed for nobler goals. And this here is a space where journalists post their findings. They might say, hey everyone, I've found the name of someone who has a registered address in Lebanon, but he seems to be sending private banking transactions through France. Does anyone know who this person is? Can you search the local Lebanese corporate registry so we can put two and two together? And we saw lots of that. And then finally, because I know people like to see the documents, 11 and a half million files were more or less all uploaded onto a secure server where journalists, no matter whether or not they're in Washington DC, or in their living room in Senegal, West Africa, could simply do a Google search as they would for any other kind of research purpose. Of course, there were more advanced search options, but simply by typing in Lebanon or corruption or uh, Hezbollah, for example, and there were hits related to Hezbollah, turned up in Panama Papers. Certainly, this passport, which is the passport of the cousin of the president of Syria, Rami Makhlouf, who you might know of. He was an early find in Panama Papers, and this, I think, was the case where many journalists thought, oh my goodness, if this law firm has been doing offshore business with such an individual, first of all, public interest now has a stronger chance of being established, and second of all, from a journalistic perspective, rubbing your fingers together and thinking, who else am I going to find? I'll leave it there so we can turn over to questions, but I hope that gives you a bit more meat on what is otherwise quite a difficult concept and project to understand, and I hope you've got plenty of questions. Yes, sir. I would, what, what I would really like to know is, like, what really motivates you? I mean, like, you're an investigative journalist, you wake up every morning, and what really motivates you to be an investigative journalist? Well, for the past 18 months, which has been exclusively on Panama Papers, I've really only consulted these documents and done these reports for 18 months. It's been, it's been a sense of outrage, personally speaking, because what you see in these documents and what you see in this project is the way in which individuals and companies, very often very wealthy individuals or very powerful individuals, in a sense, are allowed to choose the rules by which they play. And I, as someone who earns a journalist salary, don't have that luxury. So when I see someone who successfully hires lawyers, accountants, and offshore middlemen to create a company that allows him or her to pay no taxes or to pay 3% in taxes, that's an issue of public interest for me that I found wrong on a personal level. And I think in terms of the reaction we've seen from governments around the world and the public around the world, including protests in Iceland and Pakistan, is an issue that many other people are outraged by too. A lot of journalists uh, are a bit somehow disappointed. You, you s they see a lot of uh, bloggers, a lot of uh, aggregators of content who are creating these platforms and attracting hundreds of thousands of flo uh, followers, sometimes millions of followers, followers, and their job is quite gratifying. They have been selling these platforms for millions of dollars and really going in early retirement. While uh, uh, investigative uh, journalists like myself, uh, again, living on an investigative journalist salary, um, don't seem to have the same impact we had maybe 15 years ago. Okay. Um, how, how does this impact of or, or affect you as an investigative journalist? Have you been lured to looking at different type of uh, journalism uh, that are more fashionable today, or you're sticking to what you do? We're lucky at ICOJ in that we are a non-profit news organization based in America. We receive funding from external donors, many of whom are large foundations, such as the Ford Foundation or the Open Society Foundation, who give us money with the sole purpose of doing these kind of in-depth, detailed investigations. 
So in some ways, I'm in a much luckier position than many of the colleagues who we worked with on Panama Papers who had to juggle doing a story that I know many of them found personally fascinating, but also their real world or their day job where they had to write an update on, I don't know, the, the burglary of some superstar in Paris, for example. You know, personally speaking, it's no surprise that my most read Panama Papers story that wa was one that opened with a scene of Beyonce drinking champagne on a yacht in the Mediterranean. <laughs> it wasn't just about that, and I should say it's not about Beyonce. <laughs> but read the article if you're interested to know more. But investigative journalism does struggle with that. I'm enthusiastic by what we're seeing in the industry in that there are a number of non-profit investigative news organizations that are starting up especially in Latin America, in certain parts of Africa, and if anyone knows of any more in the Middle East or the Levant, let me know. But we're seeing, I think, both because journalists want it and more importantly because the public wants it, these emerging new models that are beholden to no one and not beholden to clickbait. So w what has been the impact of Panama Papers? What have you been able to achieve? So I break down impact into discernible and undiscernible and undiscernible. The first and most obvious are those that we probably already know, like the resignation of the Prime Minister of Iceland. I know that many of you will probably agree with me, and I certainly felt this at the time, that there are probably other Prime Ministers or other people with ministers in their title who may have deserved also to be on that list of resignations, but we haven't seen that yet, and that's another question uh, for another day, perhaps. But we're actually doing this kind of impact survey now of our partners. And what we're hearing is that there are nearly 150 inquiries in 75 or so nations into Panama Papers. And every week we seem to be hearing news from, say, Canada a few weeks ago, where the Revenue Authority announced it was actively investigating 85 Canadians in the Panama Papers. France recently announced it was investigating 560 taxpayers. So there are those lower level impacts that won't always make the news. We're certainly unlikely to hear of mass jailings anytime soon. But as my boss always says, the journalists in Panama Papers have done and are continuing to do their job as journalists. And now I think it's the role of civil society and by extension government to really harness the outrage of the issues that Panama Papers brings to light so that there are more impactful and more long lasting impacts. My greatest fear is that Panama Papers will excite a few people for a few months. Governments will shake their fists for a few months, but they'll soon go back to everything being as usual. And we know the offshore world is like that. We know that as soon as you close down one country, another country starts offering lucrative tax structures. So it's an ongoing solution. If you can explain, to, to, if, if you can explain it to us practically. Um, so Panama Papers, how did all these documents get there? Where were they? How did, how, did they how did we get hold of all the documents? Sorry, that might be me. Panama Papers began with those two German reporters who I showed earlier, who were contacted by... They, they were contacted by an unknown source, and before anyone asks, I can't give you names, telephone numbers, or email addresses. I don't. we go, sounds like we're back. So the question was where did Panama Papers start? It started with an unknown source whose identity remains unknown to me, so I can't answer any of your questions if that was top of your list, who reached out to a German reporter and said through encrypted emails, are you interested in data? To which the journalist, being a good journalist, responded, yes, please tell me more. And over the course of weeks and months, 
data was then shared from the source to that German reporter who then shared it via, I believe, hard drives that travelled the world that finally made its way to ICIJ. So it wasn't one dump of 11 and a half documents, it was a drip by drip transfer of these files. And we're talking about information that goes back to the 1970s until December 2015. This company's emails, faxes, passport photos, invitations to Christmas lunches, all kinds of things. Which is exciting but also the real challenge because there weren't stories to be told based on all of those 11 and a half million files. And I imagine that's a question someone will ask which is, well, how then did you find or decide which stories to go with? And so, uh, so they were transported physically on hard drive. This amount of uh, docu this amount of data cannot be via email, right? It certainly wasn't done via email. I'm not enough of a genius to work on the data team of ICIJ, so I can't say precisely. But I know that it was transferred from one location to another uh, in in stages, simply because the load was too big. What, what is the legal, uh, if you want, term, or how, how do we come to good terms? Uh, with the idea of, some people would call it stealing documents from a law firm or from some firm. Some people, like maybe journalists, will call it something else. What do we call it? Is it whistleblowing? Wh what are we talking about here? I think it depends on the side of the equation that you sit on. Certainly the law firm, Mossack Fonseca, has called it hacking and we understand has initiated a complaint with the government of Panama. I should point out, that Mossack Fonseca, the law firm says it has done nothing wrong and accurately states that it's never been convicted or charged with any criminal wrongdoing. Although as Barack Obama said, the problem here is not what's illegal so much as what's legal. So that's a separate question. As journalists, and given that we are now 450 or so journalists who've reported on this using these documents, I think very quickly we coalesced around the agreement that the material contained within Panama Papers was of such public interest that given that we as journalists hadn't actively participated in the procurement of that material ourselves, that we were entitled as journalists to use that information to do our job. And I think governments, and I know governments in different countries, have upheld that argument in subsequent decisions that they've taken recently in admitting evidence from Panama Papers into legal proceedings that are currently on foot. So, so mm. we can qualify it as like it's a whistleblower. Somebody blew the whistle. Yes. What, what should be done to motivate more whistleblowers around the world? I think first of all there needs to be much greater protection for whistleblowers. A previous project that ICIJ worked on known as LuxLeaks involved two whistleblowers who had taken documents from PricewaterhouseCoopers, one of the largest firms of its kind in the world, and those documents showed that companies had been negotiating more or less in secret with the government of Luxembourg to reduce their tax rates, sometimes to as low as half a percent. That investigation was really interesting because on the one hand you had the European Parliament Institute proceedings, draw up new laws, to combat the tax avoidance and how countries were losing billions of dollars through these schemes. But at the same time, Luxembourg itself has initiated legal proceedings against those two whistleblowers under the banking secrecy laws of the country. So even in the heart of Europe, you've got nations who still see whistleblowers as threats to democracy rather than enablers of greater yeah, democracy. I can imagine, I mean, in Lebanon, if somebody whistleblows, from a, from a ministry or mm. from uh, 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 any uh, company uh, to within Lebanon. I mean, the privacy or the secrecy or the anonymity of these people will not be protected. And the repercussions <coughs> are much more than legal. I, mean, mm -hmm. uh, I know, I spend more time in the courts than at my office. Uh, so I know exactly how, how it works. So what are the, the, the fears? like? You end up with all the, the set of data and you're motivated and you want to do work, but what are the fears in, that are running in the back of your mind? Or, uh, um, if you can tell us more, I can, mm. of course there's a lot of excitement, I'm sure, but what are the fears that you have to take in consideration? I think in the early stages, there wasn't, 
perhaps not a fear, but a concern to verify that the information we had was accurate. For those of you who followed Panama Papers after it came out, I, I never saw you no that. doubt heard rumours that it was funded by the CIA or that it was funded by the Kremlin or that it was funded by any international boogeyman that you want to identify. It seems like if you didn't like the reporting, just choose someone controversial and say it was their fault. Mm. So at the beginning, our concern was, are we as journalists being misled by a source who perhaps has an axe to grind? Mm. We very quickly determined that that wasn't the case. You can't doctor 11 and a half million documents to push a certain agenda. Mm. And the benefit of having over 400 journalists looking at those documents means they all determine the stories that they will do themselves. Unfortunately, there has been quite significant blowback against journalists who've worked on Panama Papers. We know of journalists who've been sacked from their jobs mm. in Venezuela and in Hong Kong. We know of journalists who've received threatening phone calls, Twitter and social media, for all its benefits, is certainly a tool now, as you would know as a journalist, I'm sure, that's been harnessed to attack journalists mm. when people disagree with what they're reporting, and there were some very nasty things posted online about journalists. To my no We know that there have been some media complaints taken to media complaints councils in different countries. To my knowledge, no journalist is actively involved in an ongoing serious legal matter, but as you were referring to earlier with Lebanon, different countries have different media laws and different media environments, which means that reporting what is, in a sense, private information, people's passports, people's banking details, was something that was always going to be a legal and, in some cases, unfortunately, a personal risk to journalists involved. I do think collaboration helps with that, though, without ending on a negative note. No. I'm sh very sure that there are some very powerful people in this world who thought twice about taking a journalist to court or insulting a journalist on Twitter for what they wrote in Panama Papers because they knew that we were part of a team of 400 people. Because if one Panama Papers journalist writes a story about wrongdoing in their country, that story might also be republished in the United Kingdom, in India, in Australia, in the USA. And it's much harder to slay 10 dragons than it is one. Last question before we give uh, the audience a chance to ask you a few questions. Um, you, you mentioned Twitter, you mentioned the diffusion or the exposure and the, the, the heat. Uh, how did the Internet of Things uh, change uh, the job of, of, uh, of this exposure? And <coughs> um, so how did you put it to the, to the best use, the good use? The internet in general? The internet, yeah. Whether storing the data, extracting the data. Right. And, uh, the, uh, and the second part of the question is, uh, to which extent does investigative journalists today are also responsible for advocacy uh, beyond, uh, beyond reporting? Mm. <coughs> so to the first question, as I said earlier, Panama Papers couldn't have been done without the internet and without recent advances that we've seen. The kinds of encrypted communications that all of the journalists used when emailing each other. Merely the ability to host 11 and a half million files or 2.6 terabytes in one location online is a fairly new development and that's part of why the project took so long. As a journalist, as you would know, the internet is incredibly useful for reporting out those stories. Panama Papers and one reason why I think Many of the journalists decided to use the word papers rather than leaks in the official title of that project mm. was because so much more work goes into a report like this than what the word leaks implies. Mm. I think, and we have been accused in the past of invol being involved in data dumps. And I think Panama Papers is much more than that. It's taking information that comes from a leak, certainly, but it's then verifying it through public records, conducting interviews, writing the stories, creating the one-hour news programs, that is the bread and butter of daily journalism. And then, globally speaking, the internet was a crucial way in harnessing the public response and reactions that we've seen to Panama Papers. In terms of advocacy, I think if you spoke to 10 different journalists, you'd probably get 10 different responses about where that line lies. ICIJ, for example, doesn't receive government money as part of our non-profit model, which we think enables us with more power to hold the powerful to account. 
Um, I would say, as I said earlier, that we see our role as journalists in publishing and providing information that activists, and activists include those who make decisions, such as government ministers, can then take and do something with. So at ICIJ, we certainly see our role as within the more traditional sense of journalism, the issues then to be taken up by those in the more traditional field of activism, but the lines are increasingly blurred, especially in different regions. I work with lots of reporters from Africa, and if you're a journalist in a country with zero press freedom, to write any independent news story, let alone a news story that involves Panama Papers and perhaps one of your country's most powerful individuals, necessarily, in my experience, will involve more activism than it would me sitting comfortably two blocks from the White House in Washington, D.C. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions for William? Who would like to ask him some questions? Go ahead, William. How many questions do we have? Two questions. OK, we have to take. Hi, my name is Margot. I just wanted to know in the way you investigate, actually, do you have this push uh, or is it uh, like you target, for example, a government, a company, a firm, a law firm, and then you dig deeper to get the information, or is it just uh, you take out from, uh, you know, uh, whispers? Let, let's just take that question. Mm -hmm. For time efficiency, let's, let's uh, circulate the microphone so that William can, uh, can juggle with the, with, the, with the one answer. Maybe to all. Hello, I'm Lara Halabi. I would like to know if you have journalists in Lebanon who work with the uh, Panama paper, and it will be a hard work <laughs> here in Lebanon if we know those uh, politicians who don't pay the taxes, or uh, not only politicians, those who have the power in Lebanon. Thank you. Any other question? There's a lady behind you. actually a question connected to this one and, and directed to you. Uh, my question would be how you see, do you see, an, uh, how, how you think such a collaborative model of journalism could help fight levels of corruption, level of disservice to the public by the political establishment, and how you see such efforts may be compromised by the very fact that we have a polarized media landscape where uh, media are owned by politicians themselves, Second of all, where we have a media law where defamation, libel, and slander uh, are such that truth doesn't count as a defense. Um, and, and, and people are exposed to tremendous risk uh, in exposing wrongdoing on the side of power. How would you see uh, such a collaborative model compromised by all the conditions we are facing in Lebanon? Thank you. Any other question? We have one question here and then. Okay. I'll rely on you to remind me of what they were. <laughs> Excuse me, I would like to know uh, what triggered that uh, leak of uh, papers, and then particularly this time being, and uh, is there any conspiracy theory or what have you? But that's it, thank you. That's it, okay. go ahead, William. I think the first and the last question were related. The first being, how did this investigation come to us and was, were journalists sitting in a back room plotting to take down expressly Mossack Fonseca, the law firm at the heart of Panama Papers? The answer to that is, is no. We'd reported on a number of offshore stories before and I think that, we as a network I mean, and I think that raised our profile in this area and therefore when the whistleblower deemed that he or she, John Doe is the name that they go by, when they deemed that they had information they believed ought to be made public, the German reporters who they went to, and perhaps by extension ICIJ, was something that they knew of and understood. That therefore relates to the second question, which is why now or why 18 months ago, and was there a conspiracy? I'd encourage you to look at the manifesto that John Doe, the whistleblower, published a few weeks after Panama Papers. It's available on lots of websites, including ICIJ's website, and it's quite lengthy. And this source comes across as someone who's very intelligent, 
very motivated and if you believe them at what they say, John Doe believes that he or she saw acts, in his or her words, criminal acts of wrongdoing that he or she des thought deserved to be exposed. So that was the source's own motivations for reaching out to journalists. There are, of course, different interpretations on the truth behind those motivations, and I don't have the information to judge that. But as I said initially, the public interest in what was subsequently leaked, I think, speaks for itself. Um, to move on to the other questions, w to my knowledge, ICIJ did not partner with an individual Lebanese news organisation. We did, however, and continue to work with the regional group, which is the Arab Reporters of Investigative Journalists, ARIJ, and I believe they have journalists, part of their network, who may be in Lebanon. But if I'm here today and for the next few days, it's not only for the hummus and the baba ganoush, it's also to meet <laughs> great Lebanese investigative journalists. So please come and speak to me afterwards if that applies to you. And you're right, the collaboration is a double-edged sword. And journalists are often very good about talking about successes, but like all of us, we don't really talk much about our failings. And I can tell you that there were plenty of worrying moments in the lead up to Panem Papers and in previous projects where we had thought we were working with trustworthy, reliable and independent media partners. And in the end, it turned out that, for example, they were government funded or that they had an activist bent that meant they were interested in only telling one particular side of the story. So your question perhaps goes more to how does a collaboration protect itself by choosing who it works with? And that's a very difficult question for us. We spend lots of time vetting journalists and newsrooms. My greatest fear throughout the whole 12 months of Panama Papers was that I'd wake up one morning and find that a partner from any country who we'd just given access to the Panama Papers would have pasted everything online in breach of the agreement that we make with each journalist when they come on board. So it's a challenge and there are risks, but we've seen that the risks are worth taking when you can have this kind of global impact that we've seen. Yeah, the expense also to sign maybe a <coughs> bit no <coughs> obnoxiously pretentious uh, of executive magazine. You have worked in the last 15 years with some something around 500 journalists, investigative journalists. Uh, some are still live in Lebanon, some uh, uh, moved somewhere else. Uh, we, we keep close ties. Uh, the most important thing, if I'm in a position to give advice, uh, is not to forget what is the vocation of journalism and to start with. Uh, of course, when you live in Lebanon, you really want Lebanon to become the country you want to live in as compared to the one that has become. And that's what motivates us every morning, whether me, whether it's Thomas, whether it's Bidas in the room, Matt, Jeremy, Olga, Nabila, and the rest of our investigative team. Uh, of course, nobody gives us data. You know, um, uh, we have to go and get it. Uh, and there, there are certain dangers. You have taken consideration, not to mention getting uh, 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 the frustration of getting to court. For example, I can give the latest case which basically we won a case against Gibran Basile uh, uh, in court uh, after <coughs> basically we exposed uh, some financial discrepancies relating to the seismic studies where $45 million have disappeared. Uh, what's frustrating is you have a judge that rules in your favor, uh, yet he doesn't send the file for investigation. You know, so, okay, we're very happy that we won the case and uh, uh, it, it proved that our work uh, is irrefutably uh, uh, compliant with best-in-class uh, journalism, yet you would have loved to see that specific file go to investigation and we would love to see people behind bars. Um, so, again, we should not give up hey, um, and hence the activism, you know, we are at stake here. Mm -hmm. And when you fall on a name like Rahim Makhloub, you know, uh, when, you're, you're, when you're covering it out of, uh, out of Washington, it's one thing. But when you live in Lebanon, mm. it's something totally different. You know, uh, your family is at risk. Uh, uh, your friends are at risk. Your business is at mm -hmm. risk. All your interests are at risk. 
you have to take all that in consideration. Yet, if you want to be an investigative journalist, this should not stop. William, yes. thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure uh, William will be with us. So if you have any more questions, uh, don't hesitate to ask him. Uh, thank you very much. Well.